Boone County has always been a place rich in natural resources. Even today, residents find unique and valuable remnants of the county's natural heritage throughout Kane County. Of special importance to many Kane County residents are the rivers, streams, ponds, lakes, and wetlands which course through the county, providing at once wildlife habitat, natural filtration, flood protection, recreation, an occasional meal, and even spiritual solace. These natural areas are what have attracted people to settle in the Fox River Valley for centuries. Since the days when the Sauk, Fox, and Potawatomi Native American tribes inhabited the shores of the Fox River, communities have thrived by tapping into the aesthetic and economic value of the region's natural resources. Over 150 years have passed since Kane County was incorporated and officially recognized by the United States government. Since the end of the Black Hawk War in 1835, the landscape of the county has changed dramatically. Successive waves of new settlers and immigrants arrived and established new land uses such as farms, homes, and communities. Due to its proximity to the Fox River and key location along several regional railroad lines, the population of Kane County doubled from 65,000 in 1890 to 130,000 in 1940. The population doubled again to 260,000 by 1970. Kane County's population today is estimated at 400,000 and is steadily increasing due largely to expansion from the Chicagoland area. Such rapid growth and development has presented the county with many challenges. Precious natural resources, once seemingly ubiquitous and impervious to change, have been and are still being swiftly altered and consumed. Agriculture and urbanization are two forces which have had and continue to have the greatest impacts on Kane County's landscape. Agriculture continues to occupy the largest land use percentage in Kane County. Nearly 65% of the county's land area remains in farm production. The shift from a prairie landscape to active agricultural production began in the 1830s. As a result of that shift, the county's water resources were significantly impacted. Prairies and wetlands were drained with ditches and field tiles to allow consistent soil moisture conditions for crop growth. Small streams were straightened and cleared of vegetation to speed drainage and improve farming conditions. Construction of urban areas also began in the early to mid-1800s. Commerce along the Fox River and near the railroads attracted many permanent settlers then and that economic stability continues to draw residents to the area today. The infrastructure required to support the county's ever-growing communities has also had its impact on natural areas and water resources. Water resources in urban areas have historically been treated as a nuisance and as a utility. For decades, urban stormwater drainage systems were designed to channel runoff from rooftops, driveways, parking lots, and streets directly to nearby stormwater systems. Streams were straightened and put underground into pipes in order to speed drainage from urban areas and prevent flooding. These agricultural and urban changes to the county's land and water features have had several unintended consequences. Removal of streamside and other native vegetation reduces stream bank stability and allows more sediment and other pollutants to reach the county's waterways. Straightening creeks and streams and installing stormwater systems has led to increased downstream flooding, erosion, and water pollution. In July of 1996, regions of Kane County experienced record flooding as a result of unprecedented rainfall. In Aurora, almost 17 inches of rain fell in less than 24 hours. The flooding caused massive damages throughout southern Kane County totaling nearly $14 million in the Blackberry Creek watershed alone. I actually live on the um, southwest side of Aurora in the area most affected by the flood. So I lived right through it. Um, a lot of my neighbors and friends um, had water 10 feet, 12 feet high in their, in their houses. Um, we, had a week, we had a week after that uh, where we, all of us just cleaned our houses out. We had garbage trucks were running constantly and it was just total devastation. It was, it was like living in a disaster area. And um, 
You know, it, it was something that I'll never forget. You know, you always see those things on television. I'd never quite lived through one. I never thought our area was susceptible to a flood of that nature. So I'll, I'll never forget it. These issues are compounded by the shift from a wetland and prairie ecosystem to a landscape of increasing turf grass and pavement. Impervious surfaces such as rooftops, driveways, streets and parking lots prevent water from draining into the ground and also increase downstream flooding and water pollution. Studies have shown that the first wash-off of city streets and urban surfaces is often more polluted than the contents of sanitary sewers. Unfortunately, it has sometimes seemed that Kane County's progress brought with it a list of increasing problems. In fact, in 1999, a group called American Rivers listed the Fox River as the seventh most endangered in the United States due to the urbanization pressures present in and around the Fox River in Kane County. However, the natural resources that attracted Native Americans and settlers to this area centuries ago have not all been lost. Those pieces of preserved landscape are prompting new thought about managing land in Kane County. Local and county officials have begun to incorporate restoration and conservation measures into new and existing plans and regulations. For example, the county and all cities and villages monitor new developments for compliance with current erosion and stormwater ordinances and encourage new and innovative practices. When we meet with new developers here in Kane County, what we like to encourage them to do is to use uh, a Kane County version of conservation design. In other words, about 60% of our land here in Kane County is the, the higher land, the, the land better suited for development. And generally speaking, about 40% of it is uh, really not very good for putting houses uh, on. It's um, either in the floodplain or it's a wetland or it's got a, it's a hydric soil. It's got a soil with a high water table, especially in the springtime. Um, and it's better suited for other uses, open space uses primarily. The Kane County Development Department has also published a Kane County 2020 Land Resource Management Plan. The plan calls for specific land development patterns and methods to minimize the impact of new development on land and water resources. Some of the uh, specific uh, future practices, you know, so some of those we have in place now, I'd just like to see them carried out more. Uh, one of them includes you know, preservation of open space. Uh, in new subdivisions right now in Kane County, we're trying to achieve 40% open space in each uh, subdivision. Uh, I would like to see increased use of buffer strips along rivers and streams. Uh, I'd like to see increased uh, use of natural area. That's probably been one of our, our larger battles, is trying to get developers and builders to uh, use more natural areas and more natural plantings in, in their landscape and get past this uh, issue that they can't sell a lot or they can't sell a house if there's weeds behind it. The Kane County Environmental Management Department passed a new countywide stormwater ordinance in the year 2000. The new ordinance calls for all future developments in the county to incorporate management practices which will reduce downstream flooding while also encouraging practices like reestablishing native plants. As development occurs in Kane County, traditionally it's, it's corn and soybean fields that are being converted over into development. When that occurs, you're taking those fields and you're putting on roads and rooftops and sidewalks which are impervious surfaces. Water can't percolate and infiltrate from the surface into the ground. With that, we're producing more stormwater runoff. In addition to that, there's pollutants that occur with those runoffs. But what we're trying to do is regulate that additional water that's running off of properties after development versus what was occurring when it was in a corn and soybean field. Well, we feel we've done a very, uh, a very good job with our stormwater ordinance. Um, we feel it's pretty strict, and, and we really think, you know, in future developments, that we're going to be strict and, and, and future developers are going to have to provide for stormwater facilities that prevent future flooding. But in, in, a, br in a greater sense, we, we want to take a proactive approach and, and, and have some areas, natural areas that will hold water. Uh, we're lucky in Kane County because the, the headwaters of almost all of our major watersheds are still in undeveloped areas. And we, in a combination of county government along with the forest preserve. We want to buy, buy the floodplain areas and the wetlands and enhance them that, so they can store water in a natural way. And, and we feel that we started our stormwater program at a really opportune time 
um, that we can go back to the land handling the water in a natural way. Agriculture has also made great strides in reversing negative impacts of former farming practices to water quality and natural areas. Agricultural producers are now participating in several state and federal programs aimed at installing and maintaining new agricultural conservation measures. In the past 10 to 20 years, farmers have um, reduced the amount of uh, fall plowing that they're doing. They're doing uh, less and less tillage, leaving more of the crop residues on the surface, protecting the surface from the raindrops, and therefore decreasing um, the erosion. So that reduces the sediment that gets into the surface water features. In addition to that, they're taking and uh, doing a better job, I think, on managing the, uh, the nutrients that they're supplying to the field. They're looking at the soil, uh, identifying the level of nutrients that is in the topsoil that the crops need, and applying only those nutrients that are needed to sustain productivity of the land. Farmers are now making use of the latest technology to maximize their production while minimizing impacts to their land and water. I think one of the biggest changes is in the improvement in technology with the crop protectants we use and biotechnology. In the past, we would have to treat the soil to control the weeds. With advances, now we let the weeds grow and we kill the weeds and not leave any residue in the soil. And with biotechnology, we're able to, in fact, eliminate use of some crop protectants. Officials in Kane County have also gone to great lengths in recent years to protect and reestablish natural areas. These open spaces and new natural areas help improve water quality by filtering pollutants from the water and allowing more runoff to soak back into the ground. Well, the natural areas uh, serve as uh, areas that are, uh, can be used for infiltrating or uh, allowing the surface water to percolate down into the groundwater system. With the urbanization or with the paving over of uh, these uh, natural open spaces, we then uh, don't al allow enough area on the Earth's surface for groundwater to, to get reintroduced into the, into, into the groundwater table system. Um, it's important that we keep these open spaces, these natural areas. If we continue to pave them over, uh, we will then be forced to find other supplies for water. Um, and those supplies are going to be much more expensive than the groundwater systems that we use today. Preserving open spaces in Kane County will allow for the continued protection of the amount and quality of groundwater which is available for residents' use. The people of Kane County and the Kane County Forest Preserve District passed a bond referendum in 1999 to purchase additional land for conservation. The Forest Preserve District also works to reestablish natural conditions on purchased properties. One example of a highly successful and functional natural areas project is Oakhurst Forest Preserve in Southeast Aurora. The site today serves as a grand scale example of the filtration and purification capacity of natural ecosystems. Oakhurst uh, is the about a 300 acre forest preserve uh, with open fields in between it, uh, between the various woods on the, in the forest preserve on the east side of Aurora. And uh, the low, there were wetlands there that, uh, uh, where considerable flooding had taken place. And uh, uh, upstream uh, from this flooding in the higher parts of Aurora, they were also having uh, uh, water problems. And there is a seven foot storm sewer that drains into Oakhurst, and here was an opportunity for the city to put in a detention system to relieve these flooding problems. And they wanted to use some of the forest preserve land, and this was an opportunity to uh, test uh, what was then a new system of uh, uh, urban stormwater runoff and treating it uh, to remove the pollutants from it. And uh, so, with the cooperation of the township and the city of Aurora and the Forest Preserve, uh, we built a 50-acre lake, uh, a one-acre uh, sediment trap, and uh, a 30-acre marsh uh, to treat the pollutants that were coming in. In pre-settlement times, most of the land, which is now Oakhurst, 
was a partly wooded, irregular, undulating peninsula on the north shores of an extensive wetland. This area is depicted on the 1842 original U.S. land survey map with the notation, Wabansia Swamp Impassable. All of the present 350-acre preserve and its two-and-a-half square mile drainage basin is tributary to Wabansia Creek. Most of this drainage basin is now urbanized. Stormwater picks up pollutants while running off the streets, roofs, parking lots, and other urban surfaces, then enters Oakhurst through a seven-foot-wide concrete storm sewer. It first flows into a densely vegetated channel, which captures larger debris, providing a first level of scrubbing. From this channel, the water flows into a quarter-acre sediment-trapping pond, where slower water speeds and other vegetative properties cause most of the muddy water soil particles to settle out. The water flows from there through this 30-acre vegetative system where a lot of good things happen biologically. Uh, there are many uh, systems in plant communities, and particularly wetland communities, to uh, metabolize and uh, digest uh, the uh, nutrients and contaminants that are in the water. And so, in short, uh, the uh, uh, water that comes in, which is often dirtier than the water in the sanitary sewers, that first flush off the of city streets, is dirtier than the water that's flowing in the sanitary sewers. And we turn this water muddy, oily, uh, raunchy looking, uh, uh, that comes in, and when it goes out, it looks like tap water and it has consistently uh, been swimming quality water that flows out of Oakhurst Lake and its tributary to Wabansi Creek. This lake is one of the best fishing spots in the area. Uh, it is uh, in a neighborhood uh, that was a low income neighborhood uh, and uh, uh, in Aurora or on the east side of Aurora and uh, it's uh, uh, motivated the neighborhood, uh, which is largely self-policing, uh, uh, to uh, upgrade the entire neighborhood. And uh, it's one of our most used forest preserves in, in the entire county. And uh, it's uh, turning a, a very negative situation into a, a very positive asset for the community. Unbelievably, the Oakhurst site was not originally designed with a primary function to clean water. Rather, the site was intended to provide downstream flood control. By making simple design modifications to the original stormwater design, both water cleansing and detention are accomplished in one valuable site. At minimal expense and with intelligent care and forethought, leaders and residents of Kane County are building this kind of functional greenbelt. Officials and citizens must acknowledge water as an asset, however, rather than a burdensome utility, as in, green pastures beside the still waters which restoreth the soul. Numerous other natural systems, both preserved and recreated, exist throughout the county on public and private land. Natural areas is the best design for water quality control and water quality enhancement. Uh, nature knew what she was doing when she designed it, and the more we can keep natural, the better we keep our water quality high. That's why it's important to have natural areas, or one of the main reasons it's important to have natural areas. And as I mentioned before, um, trees and shrubs and wildflowers break the fall of a raindrop. It has a lot of energy and uh, scatter that energy, and so it doesn't erode the soil. They have a lot of organic matter, and they absorb the water. And draw it into the ground to refill our aquifers. We get our water from underground, so we have to, we can't just always take it out. We have to have places where it can go back in. And as it's going back in, it's being cleaned, it's being filtered. The, um, any uh, pollutants that are in it are uh, filtered out. Even private homeowners are contributing to water-friendly landscapes. Many county residents incorporate deeply rooted native vegetation into traditional landscape designs and even use water as a landscaping feature. When I was a kid, I grew up uh, at my grandparents' place, which was the Natural Gardens in St. Charles. And I think that's what formed my basis for my interest in landscaping. 
And when I bought my house in the early 90s, I went on a pond walk, which was one of the first ones in the area, and saw what people had been doing with water in their yards, and thought that was kind of a natural progression in my landscaping in my yard, and built myself a pond. And next thing I know, I built one for my dad, and then another one for myself, another one for my dad, and just kind of went from there. And I have the benefit of living near a stream also, so I get a pretty wide variety of animals coming through my yard. And I've seen things that living in the city you don't normally see around your yard, everything from foxes to coyotes to kingfishers, herons, just about everything. And they stay all year because I have water for them all year. And I provide food. I've planted literally hundreds of trees and thousands of plants in my yard since I moved in. So all those things acting together gives them everything they need to have a place to be. And I think with a lot of the natural areas in the county disappearing, um, people providing that type of stuff in their yard is just going to get more and more interesting and give more and more animals a place to go. This chart illustrates the dramatic difference between the root systems of traditional turf grass, which is found in most residents' urban and suburban lawns, and the deeply rooted native plants such as purple coneflowers, goldenrod, and big blue stem grass. The use of these native plants provides wildlife habitat, reduces the amount of water necessary for plant growth, reduces semi-impervious turf grass areas, and improves drainage back into groundwater, thereby reducing overall flooding problems. St. Charles is a very fortunate community because they have many natural areas, and most of them are actually right in Annex St. Charles, right in town. And so uh, the people in the community are very, very lucky, and not just because of the atmosphere that they give to our community and our sense of place, but because they function for us. They do so many good things for us. Um, they absorb water when it uh, falls and keep it from eroding. They um, uh, allow the water to soak into the ground and refill aquifers. And they provide wildlife habitat and uh, many, many other things. American Rivers, that same group that listed the Fox River as the seventh most endangered in the United States in 1999, removed the river from its top 10 list in 2000. While the Fox River was not suddenly and vastly improved during the year that it was listed, state and local agencies did take notice of its listing and put into place several programs and funding sources to assist in the long-term protection of the river. For example, two stretches of the Fox River were included in the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency's list of threatened water bodies and will now receive priority planning and cleanup efforts. On a larger scale, in 2000, the Lieutenant Governor Corinne Wood proposed a new program, Illinois Rivers 2020, which will allocate $2.5 billion over 20 years to restore and enhance the Illinois River Basin, including the Fox River watershed one of the Illinois River's main tributaries. King County residents and local and county officials have made great strides in recent years to improve the natural areas and water resources throughout the county. However, much work remains to be done. The existing plans and regulations must be rigorously pursued and fairly enforced to ensure the future protection and improvement of these valuable natural areas.